internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that deserves its own semi-canon novelization. Friends, it feels like some sort of cruel joke. The Five Nights at Freddy's movie came and went from theaters. It was fun. It did great financially and we all had ourselves a grand old time. We moved on and now we wait patiently for the next installment to drop where Mike seeks help for a sleeping disorder and Freddy and friends take their fort building business on the road to turn it into a major real estate venture. Everything was in balance, as it should be. And yet, they couldn't just leave well enough alone, could they? Because just like clockwork for this franchise, they turned the movie into a book. A book! Even though I announced my final episodes, I still couldn't get out of this thing fast enough, could I? Even though all the book releases were technically done for the franchise, after 22 solid books, and that's not even including the graphic novels and all the other spin-off materials, good old Scotty Cawthon found a way to squeeze one more in on me before my foot was out the door. And you know what I did? I read the thing. And I gotta say, I'm glad that I did, because let me tell you, it is a theorist gold mine. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today to tell you that the FNAF movie book. Ugh, sorry. That the FNAF movie book. Oh, I can't even say it. It physically makes me ill to acknowledge that something like this exists. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today to tell you that the book version of the FNAF movie, it tells us everything about where the film spin-off series is headed to next. And perhaps more importantly than anything, it tells us that the big reveal of chapter three is gonna be that Vanessa is a robot. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You may now commence throwing things angrily at your computer monitor. So while you're busy getting yourself an angry arm workout, what am I talking about exactly? Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's not uncommon for films to get themselves what are known as movie novelizations. Basically a book that retells the exact same story as a movie, but because it's a book, there tend to be additional details thrown in to bulk things out. Insight into characters, their thoughts, their motivations, more descriptions of scenes, things like that. As you might imagine, novelizations like these were really popular before home video because people didn't have a way to relive the theater experience at their house. Nowadays though, it's more of an additional source of found revenue for a movie. You already got yourself a script written after all, so you might as well throw in a few thousand extra words, slap a cover on it, probably just recycle some old promotional artwork, and boom! You just made yourself a couple extra bucks from the hardcore fans and the collectors. So of course, when the FNAF movie got itself one, I was legally bound to read through it with the hope and expectation that there might be some juicy lore hidden inside of its pages. And let me tell you, I was not disappointed. It was like experiencing the movie through some sort of weird multiverse. For instance, I am actually in the book. Well, Ness, my character from the movie. The catchphrases in there and everything. It is really cool. I'm described as a quote, tall, lanky, auburn-haired teen. I appreciate that book. You know what they say, the camera adds 10 pounds, but the novelization removes 20 years. That said, on the subject of learning more lore, apparently, and I didn't even know this as the guy who was playing the character, Ness is supposedly the son of the diner's owner, whose name is, in fact, Sparky. And that right there, that's a pretty interesting detail when you consider that there's a dog animatronic who we've all been assuming is Sparky hidden in the back of Freddy's Pizzeria. It is a super unusual detail that gets just a little bit more explanation and a bit more insight all thanks to the novel. So, I'm the son of a fake animatronic dog. File that one in my character bio right alongside my undying love for Doug the lawyer. Or maybe not. You see, Doug in the books, he is a very different character. The diner scene straight up features him openly creeping on Maxine, enough so that she thinks of him as a total sleazeball. Let's just say that he's hungry for more than just the apps. Thankfully, this is one of the precious few times that Scott Cawthon has stepped in to set the record straight, explaining that this gross version of my best shipmate is in fact non-canon, and that this scene will be altered in all future printings of the novelization. In short, Nug lives on. Or would you consider us Des? Anyway, you can already see how having more words on the page gives you tons of additional context to what you're seeing on the screen, and likely more insight into the original intent of these sorts of moments. And as you might imagine, if small bit players like Doug and I are getting lore drops from the books, then the main characters are also getting a lot of extra info in there as well. For instance, in the movie, it was lightly implied that Maxine had a bit of a crush on Mike. I picked it up right here, where she subtly signals that she wants him to put a ring on it. Oh, Someone would me a ring. It's not a big plot point, but you can tell that there's a bit more under the surface of this interaction. In the book, though, it goes from subtle subtext into a full-on plot point. She constantly dresses up for Mike, dropping tons of hints about her interest, growing more and more frustrated with Mike as he's completely oblivious to her advances. In fact, it's actually part of her motivation for spying on him for Aunt Jane, which she also feels very regretful for in the books, unlike the film where she just kind of looks sad out of a window for a bit. Another huge detail about the main characters, Mike is more of a theorist in the book 
than he was in the film, actively taking on more of the responsibility for unraveling the mystery. He independently does research. He even discovers the missing children's incident by himself instead of just being told about it by Vanessa later on in the film. I guess they just had to remove that part of the character from the film lest he get compared to the performances coming from other established theorists in the community. Okay, so that's obviously a bunch of random observations and details, adding a bit more texture to these characters that either got cut for time or glossed over in a more visual storytelling medium. But there is so much more packed into this book, enough so that I believe that we can figure out exactly where the story of the next two movies is headed. And it all begins with the hill that apparently I'm gonna be dying on for my final FNAF theories, a human being a robot. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Literally. I, I'm not the one making up the story here, friends. I just interpret the clues as best I can. But in this case, we don't have ourselves a robot boy. Instead, we have ourselves a robot cop, Vanessa. Vanessa is a robot, and I suspect she's not gonna be the only one. Now, obviously, that is a huge claim to make, so let's start backing it up, shall we? Last time we talked about how Film Afton seems to be much further along in his understanding of the possessed animatronics than either his game or book counterparts. For instance, he knows that they operate based off the pictures that are hung on the wall. What have you done? He knows that, as he's dying, he needs to be wearing the golden bonnie suit in order for his soul to survive by bonding to the metal. I always come back. He even seems to have a rudimentary understanding of Remnant based on the existence of that weird Torture Freddy mask. I mean, seriously, these animatronics are not inventing a device like this. It has to have been man-made. In fact, the novelized version of the movie's cold open suggests exactly this. If you read the prologue of the book very closely, you learn that Bob, the security guard whose death opens the film, had already figured out that he was nothing more than a lamb for the slaughter in this job. First, his internal monologue acknowledges that he had been hired to guard the pizzeria. It's written expressly in sarcastic scare quotes there, showing that he knows very well that the job was never meant to be real. And as he's being dragged to his death by the animatronics, he passes by the kid's drawing of Afton holding the kid's hands. And we read that bile fills his throat in this moment. He knows that that picture and the rabbit specifically is the reason that he's currently fighting for his life. In short, the extra details in the prologue of the novelization strongly suggest that Afton is actively hiring guards to this pizzeria to harvest a remnant from them so he can continue on with his experiments. And he's using his control over the animatronics to help make all of this happen. And because of that, despite this being an adaptation of one of the earliest FNAF stories, Film Afton is likely already tinkering with much more advanced animatronic technology. Again, look no further than the cold open of the novel. The torture Freddy mask isn't just an old repurposed Freddy head like it is in the movie. Instead, it's described like this. Quote, the two halves of the bare face peeled back like the wings of a beetle, expanding outward, as the fur parted, spinning robotic mechanisms filled Bob's vision. This description of how the mask operates, with pieces that split apart and fold out, is actually much more fitting of a different generation generation of animatronic, the fun time animatronics. And what do we see in FNAF 5, the game where these fun times take center stage? Down in Afton's bunker, we see articulating humanoid robot heads, eyes constantly blinking. They're alive, and they're watching us. And these aren't just set decorations either. These heads are important enough to have been directly called out by the FNAF character encyclopedia. In the game prior, FNAF 4, Afton's final line was, I will put you back together. And in FNAF 5, we see exactly that, a bunker made by Afton full of robotic humanoids. A mad scientist of a man trying to use his robotic skills to bring a human back to life, to put his loved ones back together, literally. Going back to the movie, this is likely why we see a humanoid animatronic with teeth, silver eyes, and an arm with five articulated human fingers buried in the parts and services room. It's not just an easter egg put there from scraps laying around the Jim Henson office, this looks like it's a first generation robot person. So we have an Afton that's already harvesting and experimenting with Remnant at the beginning of this film, and we know that there's a human shaped robot buried in the parts and services room that suggests that he might have been working on some sort of human prototype. That right there, though, is still a long way away from creating a convincing enough robot that it's able to fool literally everyone around it. And why, then, would it be Vanessa, of all people? Well, the first thing I'd like to talk about here is actually something that jumped out to me the first time I watched the movie, the performance of Vanessa's actress, Elizabeth Lale. Something I noticed throughout the movie was how aloof and disconnected Vanessa seemed. Her voice was always flat, her character almost always stoic. The new security guard? Yeah. You're bleeding, by the way. You and Abby, you still have each other. From where I sit, I'd say you're lucky. And for the times that she actually did show emotion, she was flipping on a dime, seemingly out of nowhere. Take care of your sister. You can do whatever you want with your own life, but if you ever bring Abby back here again, I will shoot you. Considering the character that she's based on from the games, you'd think that she might be more bubbly or energetic based on how she was in Security Breach. Hello, little boy. If you're down here, say something. Hey, little man. Do you know what time it is? The doors are open. Why are you still here? And this isn't meant to be some sort of critique on Elizabeth Lale's performance or anything like that. We know that she's a talented actor. I mean, just check out some of the clips of her playing Anna in the show Once Upon a Time. He is Prince Charming, and you're Snow White, and those things sound terrible, but they also sound romantic. 
Eric. What is that amazing smell? Chocolate! No, the flatter delivery from her has to have been an intentional direction that she was given. Perhaps direction to sound a bit more... robotic. In the novelization, Vanessa seems to shift personalities on a dime, changing between what Mike describes as the bubbly girl mode and the intensely serious cop mode. For example, during their first night meeting, we get this, quote, Then someone invisible flipped a switch. Vanessa's cop mode deactivated. That right there? It's a pretty suspicious way of phrasing a psychological change like that. Intentionally using robotic language in this franchise? Yeah, press X to doubt. The same thing happens towards the end of the movie, too, where after Vanessa's stabbed by Afton, Abby notices this, quote again, Vanessa's eyes looked weird, like they were lights that were having a hard time staying on. And speaking of both Vanessa's eyes and her personality shifts, the absolute biggest piece of evidence here, Vanessa's eyes literally change color when she shifts personalities. Check it out, again from the book, page 144. Right after Mike tells Vanessa about his Garrett kidnapping dreams, quote, the narrowing of the eyes, the stiffening of her mouth, she was back in cop mode. No, Mike thought, it wasn't cop mode. Mode, it was something else. Vanessa's irises deepened noticeably in hue. They went from their usual soft, almost grayish blue to a deeper indigo. The color shift was so pronounced that it almost looked computer generated. Computer generated, huh? What a choice of words that is. An indigo, you say? You mean the color that some would confuse with purple? But perhaps the single most telling part of this little paragraph comes in the final line. It was enormously disquieting. Mike felt like he was watching a human turning into, and then he trails off, not having a chance to finish the thought. Turning into what, Mike? Turning into what? A robot, perhaps? And this thing with the eyes, it isn't just a one-off change, it is a consistent part of Vanessa's character descriptions throughout the entire novel. While explaining how spring locks work, quote, Vanessa's irises did the light blue to dark blue thing. Her eyes had turned an even deeper blue, navy blue now, almost black. As Vanessa's explaining her father's creations like the spring locks, again, the eyes get darker, sometimes purple and sometimes black. It's almost as if she's fallen back on some sort of Afton-designed programming, almost like he's controlling her. In fact, every time Vanessa tries to do something to keep Mike from looking into this mystery and uncovering Afton's secrets, her eyes go to this darker color. In the scene next to the storm drain where she tries to convince Mike not to try sleeping and dreaming of Freddy anymore, her eyes are dark blue. In the same scene, as Mike tries to get Vanessa to open up so he can get to know her better, he notices that her eyes grow darker and become blurred. And then something, in quotes, breaks any connection that they're forming. And yet, when she's begging for him not to go to Freddy's at all to save himself and Abby, again, quote, he looked into her eyes, so soft and blue right now that it seemed like some of her essence, life force, was leeching from her. If there's some Afton-driven programming controlling Vanessa, that would also explain one of the stranger moments from the film. After Mike is attacked by the animatronics and saved by Vanessa, she reveals the dark secrets of her past and the pizzeria. When Mike asks her to help save Abby, though, she declines. Not because she doesn't want to help, but because she feels like she literally can't. Come with me. Yeah. If he's there, I... I won't be any use to you, believe me. And when she does show up to the pizzeria later on, once confronted by Afton, she's only able to bring herself to shoot once before completely freezing up, kind of like a computer that's crashed. Even my favorite line of the movie, You had one job, keep him in the dark, and kill him if he got too close. That's two jobs. Is a robotic, process-driven answer. And before you say that Vanessa can't be a robot because we see her get stabbed and have to go to the hospital, yeah, yeah, that's admittedly the biggest point against the theory. That said, remember the franchise that we're talking about here, friends? These robots can be so lifelike, so realistic that you cannot tell them apart from real humans at all. They eat, they sleep, they breathe, they can even bleed like Charlie does in the original FNAF book trilogy. I get that the FNAF franchise tends to be cryptic, but time and time and time again, there have been signs that someone in this franchise is a robot. Maybe it was Gregory from Security Breach. We know for a fact that Charlie from the book trilogy was, Jessica from Frailty, Billy from B7, Sarah from To Be Beautiful, the list goes on and on and on. They are hitting us over the head time and again with these kids who become robots. And if I just keep saying that one of these characters is in fact an animatronic, eventually I will be right. Right? Right. This would even make some strange imagery from the games make more sense. Remember the unmasked ending from Security Breach? No, of course not. Why would you? Well, in it, we see two Vanessas. One who's fallen to the ground and died, while another's still up on the roof of the building looking down at the scene. This was always weird, and we as a FNAF community just kind of politely ignored it. But it suddenly makes a lot more sense if Vanessa is in fact a robot. This is just two recreations of the same model. One became active the second the other one died, which again is something that we see happening in the original novel trilogy with Charlie Bots. But why? Sure, Afton might be creepy and he's even creepier in the book, but why go through all of this trouble? Keep the pizzeria up and running, hire new guards to farm remnant from, create an animatronic as human as Vanessa? Why is he doing it? Well, the answer seems to be staring us in the face throughout the movie. It's this. The Ella Springlock suit in the back. Think about it. Vanessa is incredibly cautious around this animatronic in the film, warning Mike not to go near it and going as far 
Pixar is threatening to shoot him if he brings Abby back to the pizzeria. If she loves all these animatronics so much, why is she so cautious about this one? Well, what if it already killed someone? Someone Vanessa knows very well. Someone like herself. Afton's daughter, the original Vanessa. I believe that in his desire to create the best animatronics possible, Afton created this Ella Springlock animatronic, and it ended up killing his own daughter. Just like what we see happen with Baby in the games. That is where his obsession started. His desire to find the secrets of life after death. He wanted to rebuild his daughter, and in the process, he discovered Remnant, how to create it, the pain required for it. That's why he built the torture device with the green Freddy mask, and made sure that it was close to the Ella animatronic in the parts and services room. Afton wanted to infuse the suit with Remnant, all in the hopes of bringing back his real Vanessa. Eventually, he was able to build the Vanessa that we see in the movie, but even then, she's difficult. She rebels. She doesn't want to help him as much, especially when children like Abby get involved. It's not his real Vanessa. And so Afton will keep trying, and trying, and trying. And if I'm right about this, it tells us a huge amount about where the franchise is headed in the next film. In our last theory, we suggested that Mike's brother Garrett is likely the identity of the puppet in the films, and will probably be the centerpiece of the second movie. I mean, the credits literally end with the puppet telling both Mike and the audience to come find me. However, this is gonna be a problem for Mike, Abby, and Vanessa. You see, Afton has a strange connection with Garrett. In the book, Garrett actually appears in the pizzeria during the final battle, luring Mike to a more secluded area where Afton can ambush him. Afton has control over Garrett's spirit in the scene, enough so that Garrett literally melts into the shadows that Afton emerges from. Quote from the book, It was as if Garrett became part of the gloaming under the archway. He was there, and then he was... something else. In Garrett's place, someone in a rabbit costume appeared. Not just someone, a man. So, if Afton controls Garrett's spirit, it's likely that the puppet is going to be the villain of the second film, creating a whole new conflict for Mike to overcome. And then if the third movie follows the third game, an undead Afton will be back as the main antagonist, with the grand reveal that he's been able to make robot people the entire time. Vanessa will be revealed to be a robot, and Afton will tempt Mike with exactly what he wants. He could put Garrett back together as a robot kid, exactly the way Mike remembered him as a child, just as Afton did with his daughter. All Mike has to do is help Afton with his evil experiments, and Mike then will be left with a choice. Just how badly does he want his brother? Brother back. Guess we'll have to watch the movie, and then read the corresponding eight-book series released afterward to find out. But hey, even though Vanessa might be mechanical, there's one thing I know she'd be able to appreciate the sponsor of today's episode, Air Up, the water bottle that hacks your brain. Listen, at this point, if you've been watching any fierce content for the past year, you know what's up with these guys and how much we love Air Up. Air Up water bottles have become a staple across the office, and I don't actually know if anyone in the company doesn't own one at this point. And honestly, why wouldn't they? Air Up has completely changed the way that we drink water by tricking our brains into thinking and it has flavor, all without any sort of weird pizzeria magic at play. See, our senses are more connected than you might think, especially when it comes to smell and taste. And Arup water bottles use this to their advantage by using smell to influence what you're tasting. Their water bottles have these straws that can be equipped with scent pods. And when you drink through the straw, air also pulls the smell of the scent pod into your mouth. That scent hits the back of your nose, and bam, you taste what you're smelling through the straw, all without any sorts of artificial flavoring or chemicals. No need for one of Afton's magical sci-fi creations here, my friends. This is all real science that really works. Steph and I recently gave up both sugar and caffeine for weeks during the month of January, and Arup's Cherry Cola flavor pods really came in clutch for me during those soda withdrawals. Also, Arup has these awesome steel bottles that have higher capacity and stay cool longer. These guys are now my default anytime I need to hydrate in my day-to-day -day life. So if you're looking to completely change how you hydrate yourself, go check out the link in the description to go see what Arup has to offer. You will not be disappointed. Once again, thank you to Arup for sponsoring this episode, and as always, my friends, I'll see you next week.